Good afternoon. My name is Angela Fernandez and I am the Commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights. Welcome to our agenda and LGBTQ webinar. Before we proceed, I would like to ask that everyone who's calling in uh, put their phones on mute. At the end of the webinar, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for you to type in uh, your questions. So I wanted to start this webinar um, in grounding uh, all of our work. It is really important to ground our work in the leaders that were directly impacted and that were the ones that put their lives on the line so that today, 50 years later, we can actually discuss these laws that protect millions of people. And here we have Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera who put their lives on the line so the rest of us can live with freedom and dignity deserving of all human beings. And that is really what we are about here at the Division of Human Rights. These transgender women of color led the Stonewall riots um, through a two-day uprising in response to the police brutality that their communities had suffered for decades simply because of their identity. And this fight was the beginning of the LGBTQ rights movement. And today, here, we at the New York State Division of Human Rights celebrate them and we're very proud to be able to celebrate them by sharing what our laws are, not only new laws, but also old laws, because New York State has actually been a leading state in the country on these kinds of protections. So we are here today thanks to them. And with that, I would like to um, pass the mic over to our general counsel, Caroline Downey, who will walk us through the laws and also provide examples. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to start with what we will be covering today, uh, so you have a, a bit of an idea. Uh, I will say at the outset, as, as many of you know, uh, we're at the very last um, of, a, of a legislative session that is, has been very active, and as I go through these slides, which we prepared a few days ago, I will note a few changes that are coming that have already passed the legislature, not effective yet, but I want to let you know because uh, the, things are changing as we speak and I can at least introduce you to a few of them. So I do want to start with uh, going over the human rights law and its general jurisdiction so you'll know just how broad and deep we go. Uh, so it'll go to employment, housing, public accommodations and, and some other areas that we cover. I'm going to get specific on uh, the protections on the basis of sexual orientation. We'll have some examples and cases in those. Uh, we've covered that since 2003. Can someone please um, uh, put their phone on mute? We're getting some feedback here. We're also going to, we're going to cover the protections uh, on gender identity or expression with examples and cases as well. And then a very important piece of this, I think, is the enforcement provisions of the human rights law as enforced by us as the Division of Human Rights. We need uh, to let you know how to file a claim, how claims are investigated, how cases go to trial, what kinds of relief we can get, and what remedies can be awarded. And we really want to encourage people to come talk to us and come file with us. And I hope by the end of this, you'll see that it's an easy, prompt, expeditious process that is really uh, very user friendly and we want and we're going to just keep working to continue that. So that being said, the human rights law is the oldest anti-discrimination law in the nation. It was passed in 1945, so what that 74 years ago. And it, it's uh, okay, we need to do something about this. I don't think Okay, I think we can continue. It got a little quieter. Uh, so 1945 uh, was, was the beginning of the passage. It just went to employment to begin with, but housing was added not long thereafter. Uh, you can find all this in Article 15 of the Executive Law, which is called the Human Rights Law. And there's just a little quote of uh, how important this law is to the state of New York. Uh, it's part of the police power of the state and it promotes the public welfare, health, and peace of the people of the state and the constitutional provisions of the state. So I'm talking today uh, mostly about sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, so I've put those uh, right up there in front. 
uh, and I'm going to talk about them in some detail, but let me go through the other areas, the other 16 areas that we cover, uh, just so that you know, uh, sometimes cases are brought on more than one basis, certainly, and just so you know what all our bases are. So we have uh, race, color, national origin, and creed. Those were the original, uh, original bases in 1945. We have familial status, which means um, people who have uh, children under the age of 18 or who are pregnant or adopting. Uh, we have creed, as I mentioned, which can include reasonable accommodation for uh, religious observance and religious dress and garb. Uh, we've had sex uh, in the, in the um, statute for a long time, and I'm going to talk about the inter section of gender identity or expression with our sex and disability provisions uh, in a minute, but sex is very uh, broad based under the human rights law and we cover pregnancy, uh, sexual harassment and harassment on all these bases. And uh, there's been movement in the legislature that has passed both houses now to really beef up some of the sexual harassment provisions and some of the provisions of the human rights law generally. Uh, we also cover age from uh, age 18 and up, so that uh, in any one federal law starts at 40 degrees, uh, 40 years, excuse me, and, uh, but we cover people from 18 and up to uh, uh, any age at all. We cover uh, disability, as I mentioned, and that's a very broad uh, area under the human rights law, a very generous definition of disability basically anything that has a uh, medical condition of, of any sort that is clinically shown. So it's not nearly as narrowly drawn as the federal standard. Uh, you may know under the federal standard, certain gender related um, uh, conditions are excluded from the Americans with Disabilities Act. They are not excluded under the human rights law at all. And gender dysphoria and other trans, uh, transgender related issues and, and medical uh, issues are covered by the human rights law, and that's with respect to all areas of the human rights law. So, uh, to continue with our our, uh, up our lineup here, we cover marital status, we cover military status, we cover predisposing genetic characteristics. Um, the next two are really a, a broad area of our law, a very important area of our law that I won't get into today, and that can be another webinar one day because they're very uh, important to us and we do a lot of work in the area of discrimination because of favorably resolved arrest records or sealed records or youthful offender status. Uh, that's just been amended to add uh, adjournments and contemplation of dismissal as well. Uh, that was part of the budget bill that is uh, effective in July. A prior conviction record is a lot of what we do here. It's a complicated area. It deals with employment and licensing and the limits based on uh, conviction records in terms of uh, an employer's being able to deny employment on that basis. We cover uh, domestic violence victim status. We cover pregnancy related conditions in a number of areas. Uh, in a number of ways as, as sex, as disability, as familial status, and also as a separate category as of a couple of years ago of pregnancy-related conditions, again, interpreted very broadly. And finally, retaliation, which pertains to all these uh, case, all these bases, and it's a really important part of our law and all anti-discrimination law because frequently, uh, even if the underlying case isn't as strong uh, as it might be or isn't even necessarily going to win at trial, often uh, housing providers or employers uh, will sort of just not be able to help themselves from retaliating against a person for complaining about discrimination. And that's what the retaliation provisions cover. So that you can complain about discrimination to your employer, to your housing provider, to any place of public accommodation, to your school. You can complain about it to the Division of Human Rights or the EEOC, or you can file a complaint in court, uh, or you can assist in complaints that um, are filed by others and or be a witness, and all those are protected activities under the human rights law. And sometimes there will be a finding of retaliation even if the underlying case isn't proven. So just to mention quickly, um, The uh, major areas of our jurisdiction, I'm going to talk about employment, housing, and places of, pu of public accommodation in a little more detail, 
We also cover uh, non-religious educational institutions, public and private, uh, the public aspect of the law, the public education aspect of our law has, uh, is, is just being added in as part of this legislative session. It's a really important area of law that we cover. We actually covered it till 2012 and there was a court case uh, divesting us of jurisdiction. And since then, we've only covered private education, really important, especially in the areas we're talking about today uh, to cover uh, public schools as well in terms of how students are treated, uh, especially um, kids who, are, are, um, who belong to the communities we're talking about today, the levels of, of bullying and, and uh, harassment um, are, are well known. So that's a very uh, important plus of our law uh, that we'll be able to enforce vigorously in the coming months. Um, we cover credit as well. We cover insurance with respect to arrest records. Uh, we don't, um, we don't uh, cover insurance directly necessarily, but we cover merit, many aspects of insurance relative to employment, uh, credit, those kinds of areas, equal, ac uh, equal access to insurance, where it's part of a condition or privilege of employment or credit, uh, we cover and, and vigorously enforce. We cover licensing for professional occupational licenses, boycotting, blacklisting, and volunteer firefighters are some of our smaller areas of jurisdiction. So just, uh, I'm gonna make some changes as I talk to you because this is one of the areas where there've been some changes since we wrote this last week um, and it, uh, the first one, employer, the human rights law, and again, we enforce the human rights law, covers all employers, public and private, who have at least four employees. That is going to be uh, one or more employees uh, once, once this legislative session is, is done. Uh, and that means that all employers will be covered by the human rights law. So you see there in the second bullet, sex harassment, which as I said, can include harassment based on gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, one employee, domestic workers, one employee. Now it's going to be all employees once the effective date, and I'm not sure when the effective date is going to be, but uh, within the near future, all employers will uh, be answerable under the human rights law for all areas of employment. And that is um, a huge uh, distinction. Um, there are a number of situations where people are the only employee or one or two or three, and those, those uh, employers will be covered now as well. Uh, so, we cover what you would expect if you're familiar at all with discrimination law in terms of employment, hiring, firing, uh, compensation, um, any kinds of terms, conditions, or privileges. A lot of work uh, that we do is in the area of reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities and also people with uh, religious requirements. Uh, those are also terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. Harassment because of any of these bases. Um, that I've talked about. Uh, some lend themselves more to harassment than others perhaps, uh, but certainly any area of harassment would be covered under our law. And any kind of advertisement or application that indicates any kind of uh, discrimination or limitation um, as to the candidate sought either for housing or employment or any kind of, uh, that any kind of patronage is unwelcome in terms of, uh, a, of a public accommodation. Housing, we cover uh, private or publicly assisted housing of all kinds, rentals, co-ops, condos, single family homes, land or commercial space. And we don't cover two family owner occupied houses. That's the major exemption. It's quite a narrow one as you can see because it has to be owner occupied. There are certain exemptions for um, people who rent to people of the same sex living in their homes or apartments. Uh, that that can uh, be something that is excluded. And there are um, uh, senior housing provisions in our law as well, but that only pertains to the senior housing aspect. They can't d discriminate on any other basis. Again, these are, these are fairly evident, refusing to sell rent, lease, housing based on a protected class. I think I, in the earlier slide, I don't know that I mentioned it, but lawful source of income is now a section under our law uh, just, uh, just recently, just this legislative session, but we're already enforcing it because it went with, uh, it was effective in April. Uh, so this is uh, an area that we're looking into any kind of subsidized 
housing or subsidies that housing applicants get uh, cannot be refused on that basis by landlords anymore. So discrimination is the terms, conditions, or privileges. Again, this includes reasonable accommodation. We do a lot in terms of access to housing, all kinds of harassment, again, all kinds of advertisement applications, questions that show any limitations. And public accommodation, this is a very broad category. Uh, it's, it's sometimes referred to a public accommodation, resort, or amusement. Uh, it's um, it's um, hotels, restaurants, bars, theaters, any kinds of those things that you would think of that are open to the public. But also it gets into hospitals and clinics. We've had uh, uh, hospitals is specifically uh, referred to in the law. We did a lot of litigation to, to make sure that medical and, and dental offices were covered. This was actually before we even covered sexual orientation. It, 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 it was people being turned away because of their HIV status frequently. And uh, we would cover that under disability even before the sexual orientation was passed in 2003. And that gives us all kinds of access to, uh, so that people have all kinds of access to the medical services they need. So basically it's establishments dealing with goods and services of any kind, doesn't matter about the size, any kind of public areas of any building uh, also uh, are, are subject to the law and that goes very frequently to accessibility for persons with disabilities. Um, so I think I've covered most of this um, uh, denial of those, display of a notice, anything direct or indirect that persons of a protected class are unwelcome, that their patronage is unwelcome. Okay, so moving on to, um, okay, uh, so the sexual orientation provisions, uh, uh, those were passed in 2002, uh, effective in 2003, uh, and all areas uh, under the human rights law that are uh, that I've just discussed are covered by the sexual orientation provisions. Uh, the, the definition is there um, in our law, as you can see. Um, I wanted to get into some examples because uh, we've we've had this law uh, now for a while, and and sometimes I think the best way to talk about uh, how the law impacts people is to talk about uh, some of the cases that we've dealt with here at the Division of Human Rights. I'm going to talk about our procedures in a little bit, but uh, when we get a case and, and investigate to find probable cause, we have a hearing at the division and a commissioner, the commissioner whom you just uh, heard, although not in 2008, uh, <laughs> uh, will issue a commissioner's order and that's appealable to court. So when I'm talking about these cases, these are cases that came through the Division of Human Rights as part of our process and then um, were, uh, there are a couple that didn't go up to court that I'm going to talk about, but most of these uh, went to the appellate division um, and uh, were affirmed there. Uh, so uh, the, the first one, the first um, case I wanted to talk to you about was um, called uh, Correctional Services uh, versus, let me just grab my stuff here, um, the Division of Human Rights. And it was a commissioner's order. The, the, this concerned a correction officer at, at the uh, Wendy Correctional Facilities in upstate New York. It was a hostile work environment case. Part of this started before the sex orientation uh, provisions were effective, but part of it uh, continued after they were. So there was a procedural issue there. But uh, this was brought on sex and sexual orientation grounds. And it was a frightful, hostile work environment case where um, a woman who was the only, um, she was the only correctional officer, uh, female in the in the uh, in the uh, prison, was uh, subjected to terrible, hostile work environment based on her gender and sexual orientation. Uh, her supervisor. Um, who, who was effectively her supervisor, he ran the cell block, referred to her frequently in obscene and sexually demeaning terms in the presence of other correction officers and inmates on numerous occasions over a period of a year. There were offensive writings, sexually explicit graffiti displayed in her workplace, filed a baseless claim against her. Uh, numerous written and verbal complaints were made by this officer to the facility and uh, they refused to uh, 
do anything about them in violation of their own policies, by the way. They did have policies in place to handle these kinds of uh, complaints and, in fact, uh, subjected this person, the complaining party, to an investigation by the inspector general, inspected her, uh, subjected her locker to a search, uh, confiscated her property, and uh, among other things, the complainant testified that she feared for her life and feared that as a correction officer, she might not be supported by other correction officers in a situation where she would need to be with people who are incarcerated. And uh, that was very, uh, that made a real impact on the commissioner who awarded $850,000 in mental anguish damages to this complainant. It was reversed, as you can see, or it was, uh, the, that award was diminished, uh, reduced, I guess is a better way of putting it, uh, by, uh, by the appellate division, but a $200,000 mental anguish award was confirmed. And this was back in 2008, so if you had to deal with inflation, that's a, you know, even a, a slightly more significant amount. So it's a very serious case, certainly, of sexual harassment and uh, uh, based on her sexual orientation sex and of retaliation, which, as I mentioned, is uh, a very uh, potent area for us to uh, explore. So this was one of the first cases following the amendment to add uh, sexual orientation to our law. Um, another uh, was uh, in, uh, of, again, a fourth department case. Um, sexual orientation uh, was at issue, refused to transfer this person to an area, uh, where a, a job that he previously held, a supervisory job. Uh, and this is an important case showing that the commissioner also has the power to order reinstatement, which she did in that case, with back pay, which was about $18,000 and a mental anguish award of about $25,000 in that case, and that was again affirmed by the appellate division. The uh, next one I wanted to talk to you about was a case of really horrendous sexual orientation in housing. I want to just sort of give a little um, taste of each of these areas. So this was a, a housing case. Uh, this uh, little blurb here does not give you the flavor of it, and you can read any of these cases. And sometimes the appellate division decisions don't necessarily give you the flavor of what went on. And if you need or want to see the commissioner's orders in these, we do keep these and we can make those available to you um, on our usual ways. And we're going to give you some information about how to get in touch with us at the end. So this was a, a situation in which a tenant had um, lived at a uh, housing uh, in an apartment building and had been actually quite good friends with her landlord for some four years before the landlord learned that she was a lesbian. And in fact, the landlord had been very nice. She babysat for her children, ate dinner with the family. This is all part of the evidence that was developed at the hearing. And then when the landlord learned of the complainant's sexual orientation, the evidence was that her behavior changed dramatically, began to engage in daily derogatory and vulgar name calling, refused to accept rent payments or make necessary repairs. Eventually, the landlord was arrested on charges of menacing, harassment, possession of a weapon, following an incident where she threw a mixture of urine and lye out the window toward the complainant, did not hit her, but then threatened her with a butcher knife, saying, I want you out of my effing, out of my place, you effing lesbian, only she didn't say effing, actually. Uh, so that, this was very serious, certainly uh, sexual harassment, and uh, the commissioner awarded um, hundred thousand dollars in mental anguish uh, damages. And in uh, housing, by the way, we can award punitive damages. And just as a little subsection to that, uh, the new laws that are coming uh, shortly, we can award punitive damages in other areas of the law as well. And in this case, there was also a fine, a civil fine payable to New York as a civil penalty uh, for this complainant. And I, I will say sort of as a postscript to this, the uh, sometimes collecting money from um, respondents is, is difficult. We appealed this case. In fact, we sought enforcement of this case at the division because the, com the respondent basically was ignoring us. We sought enforcement in court, won it, as you can see here, but we're having trouble collecting until we heard uh, from a um, title insurance company uh, a year or so later that the uh, landlord was trying to sell the building we had 
we had um, registered this award as, as a um, in, in court and, and we were able to be notified of that and before she could send the building, she had to pay all these damages, including the fine to the state. So it, it, people can run, but they can't hide, or at least if they own a building, they can't hide. So, um, and then, um, where am I here? I wanted to also mention uh, that marriage equality in, since 2011 has been uh, available in this state, but that we had for some time uh, recognized uh, 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 marriages from other jurisdictions that, um, where, where complaints had been filing, actually starting in 2006. And uh, the point here is that same-sex spouses are entitled to any kind of spousal benefits from an employer. They have to be treated equally by anybody. And then spousal benefits that are provided in the normal course by an employer have to be also imply, applied equally. Uh, I'm gonna move along a little bit on this because I don't wanna spend too much time, I wanna get to the agenda part, but just this is a case showing recognition of out-of-state marriage that, again, this is 2008, so 11 years ago, um, moved along the fourth department recognizing just the proposition that I mentioned. And um, the, I do wanna mention this case because we hear about this a lot. This was a division case, this kind of issue a lot. Uh, there was just a recent uh, case and then a Supreme Court case about a year ago um, having to do with uh, places of public accommodation refusing to um, to uh, provide their services to people of, of the same sex or you know anybody in that in that sense. But um, and the um, this case was a division uh, was involved a uh, couple of the same sex who sought to use a wedding venue up in the country. Uh, and, and they were having a very nice interview with the people who had the wedding venue, it was a farm venue. Um, and um, they were, everything was fine until, um, uh, well, actually only one person was there at the time, one of the women who referred to her fiance as a she, and all of a sudden a, a, a curtain came down. It was going to be a problem, we don't do that. Uh, this was, um, there were many defenses raised here. It's a, it's a good case that you can read if you like. It went, it went uh, to the third department. It's an excellent decision. Uh, basically, they raised issues as to whether it was a place of public accommodation, whether their religion exempted them. Uh, there are very good issue in discussion of constitutional issues of free exercise of uh, the free exercise clause, free exercise of religion clause. Uh, free speech, compelled speech, various other issues that I recommend this decision to, uh, that came originally from the division, but a very good uh, decision by the third department too. Okay. Here we go. Um, so we're delighted that in January of this year, the HRL was, I will say, finally amended to add gender identity or expression as an explicit covered category. And that's because it had been in the legislature for many years uh, and, and had not passed both houses. And uh, it's covered in a number of other jurisdictions. Fortunately, um, we've been able at the division and under the human rights law to cover gender identity under the uh, categories I talked about earlier, uh, even prior to this, under the sex and disability provisions of the human rights law. And in fact, we issued uh, regulations uh, at the governor's direction uh, back in 2015 and 16, um, and they're found uh, at uh, that citation there and on our website, just showing that these uh, two categories do cover gender identity. And we are now in the process, by the way, of amending those regulations uh, just to show that it is also covered directly under the law because it's always better to have things directly covered under the law. So um, this is the definition in the law that was just passed, which is very similar to definitions that have been used, but it is uh, gender identity or expression defined in the new amendment as meaning a person's actual or perceived gender-related identity, appearance, behavior, expression, or other gender-related characteristic, regardless of the sex assigned to that person at birth, including but not limited to uh, the status of being transgender. 
And as I mentioned, the uh, sex and disability provisions, um, I'll just scoot back to that for a minute, uh, that, that we cover, uh, just to explain that a little bit, because when we take these cases now, we are continuing to take them on the new basis of gender identity or expression under the law directly, but we're also taking them on as sex discrimination cases and where the complainant wishes to is disability provisions under the human rights law because it does give, it, it, there's a certain belt and suspenders aspect to it, but it does give certain additional uh, protections um, that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, so we do take these on all bases and, and the theory behind uh, sex is that, that, that sex just includes gender identity and the status of being transgender. It's partially grounded in sex stereotype theories, but it also is, is grounded in other theories of, of direct sex discrimination. And as I mentioned, the very broad disability uh, provisions under the human rights law uh, have to do with uh, conditions such as gender dysphoria or other related conditions that are uh, gender dysphoria being a recognized medical condition relating to having a gender identity uh, different from the one assigned at birth. And sometimes that's important in terms of the kinds of reasonable accommodations, time off for medical appointments, that kind of thing uh, that will uh, be a benefit to bringing a case and having it covered under the disability provisions as well. So, and as I mentioned, the Americans with Disability Act specifically excludes those kinds of conditions in their definitions of disability. So, wanted to just go over, you know, just some of the kinds of things that, uh, you know, we, we, we are looking at and have looked at in looking at these cases, uh, the kinds of things that, uh, how discrimination can manifest itself with respect to gender identity or expression. So, uh, and, and there, uh, some are interrelated, and again, they can relate to any of these areas. So we're talking about questions about gender identity uh, or what the assigned sex at birth was, um, and that would be in a job or housing interview or, you know, public accommodation, school, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, refusing to hire for a job or rent an apartment or allow equal access to credit or a public accommodation or a school. Um, terminating employment or housing, or again, any differing terms, conditions, or privileges, which is the language that goes through all these areas, terms, conditions, and privileges, uh, very broadly uh, uh, looked at. Denying the use of restrooms or other facilities consistent with a person's gender identity, and that's kind of connected with forcing a transgender person to use a single occupancy restroom because of someone else's concerns. Uh, anybody who wants to should be able to use a single occupancy restroom if there is one, uh, but they're certainly not, you know, the transgender person because someone else purports to be uncomfortable uh, by using the, uh, the uh, facility that is consistent with a person's gender identity. Uh, re, uh, requiring individuals to show medical or, or other documentation um, again, this is equal access, medical or other documentation in order to use facilities such as restrooms, locker rooms, residential facilities uh, consistent with their gender identity. Again, that's a, that's a, a, a broad uh, area. Those are just some examples, restrooms, locker rooms, et cetera. Um, that's, again, based in, in equal access. Requiring grooming or uniform or appearance standards that are based on sex stereotypes providing a benefit, leave, or reasonable accommodation that differ based on gender, uh, refusing to use an individual's name or pronoun. So these are just some of the ways uh, that, that uh, this kind of discrimination can manifest itself. There are certainly others, but these are just some examples. So I wanted to talk about a case uh, that we did have, and, and um, I want to leave uh, enough time, so I'll kind of move through this, but this is a, a case called Fuller versus Advanced Discovery, and it was affirmed uh, by the Appellate Division uh, in, in just in 2018, just last year. Uh, and the, this case, again, is available from us. The Appellate Division decision doesn't say too much except affirming it, but uh, the, the facts and, and circumstances are, are available for us. But I think they, they're kind of worth uh, spending a little time with because it's the kind of situation that people might uh, encounter in the workplace. So 
the complainant was qualified to work as a mechanic uh, for, and this the commissioner found, as, uh, was as qualified to work as a mechanic for this respondent on the day they, that the respondent terminated her as she was on the day she was hired two years before when she was known by a male name or a, uh, it presented as a male. Uh, in that period of time, she was diagnosed with gender dysphoria and began to present as a female. Uh, they, uh, as noted here, she was terminated on the day that she handed a court order changing her legal name to, to uh, her na name now, Fuller, Erin Fuller. And um, her, uh, the, uh, she did, she, but a lot of stuff had gone on before that as well. Uh, there had been 25 years, she was a mechanic for 25 years. Uh, at the time she was hired, she dressed in, in typical men's clothing. She began to identify, she testified as a female when she was five years of age, however. And she had a doctor's certificate uh, that uh, she provided to her employer explaining she'd been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. She was required to appear dressed as a female, these are quotes, and is to be allowed full access to the women's restroom to be treated in all respects as a female. And the doctor cautioned that treat, being treated as anything other than female could seriously undermine her client's mental and physical health. And after receiving this letter, petitioners continued to refer to Fuller as Edward. Uh, she disposed at this time, she stopped wearing male clothing and began wearing the quote is modest female attire. Um, and uh, she was told he did not like what she was wearing when she was wearing a tank top and had a bra strap visible. And there's evidence that her coworkers regularly wore tank tops to work. Uh, she presented a court order uh, in, in um, changing her name at which time her supervisor said, now I have a problem with your, commission, your condition, I have to let you go. The person from HR, it says, was gesturing to this person to stop speaking, but this person did not. Uh, told Fuller the economy was in very bad shape all of a sudden, they said, and had to lay her off all of a sudden. Uh, there, there are more facts in here. She was really not told any reason there, for her termination. Uh, in fact, when she came back, pick up her last check, which they insisted on giving to her in the name of Edward Fuller. Uh, she was told uh, her job would be waiting for her as long as she came in, in in normal clothes. But they presented defenses that I won't go into that were uh, the, uh, relative to performance and some other issues. They were not credited by the commissioner or the court in this, and the award was $30,000 in mental anguish damages and a, uh, and a civil fine. Uh, of $20,000 and a certain amount of back pay as well. Uh, just one other case I wanted to mention uh, was this one also uh, from earlier uh, in the teens. Uh, this is a division case that was not appealed. Uh, again, a gender dysphoria case. Um, and uh, that, that's an important one in that um, the uh, back pay was awarded in this case and $20,000 in compensatory damages. Um, I want to move on because we are already at 314 to a very quick little rundown of, of what we do and how we want you to come to us and file complaints with us so that we can continue to enforce these laws. So just, um, just uh, how we file complaints, I, I did want to say we have over 6,000 complaints a year filed with the Division of Human Rights at our 11 regional offices around the state. 12? 12. 12. 12. Um, uh, regional offices around the state. And you can also, and uh, they're mostly employment cases, about 80% historically have been employment, maybe 10 or 12 housing. Uh, but I wanted to start this all out by saying we have no backlog of cases and we can address your concerns very promptly. And uh, this was not always the case some years ago. It, it took a lot longer, but for some time, we've now been able to complete our investigations in about 8, 180 days. And uh, I'll explain a little what the procedures are if, if the, it goes farther than the 180 days. Many, many are fewer than 180 days, of course, but 
something like 97% of our cases are completed within 180 days at the investigatory stage, which uh, means that you can you can see what's happening and, and uh, see what's happening with your case very promptly. So you can file a complaint by coming into the division or going to our website. Uh, the complaint has to be filed within one year. Uh, I will say that part of our new um, laws uh, makes a sex harassment case available for up to three years at the division. That won't be happening for a while, but that was, that's coming down the road. And as I mentioned, sex is a sort of an overarching basis for all these kinds of uh, complaints I've been talking about. Uh, and one can file a case in um, directly in state court within three years of the alleged discrimination. Uh, and figuring out when the discrimination occurred is not always so clear cut. We really recommend you talk to us and, and you know, if there's anything going on or even went on what seems like close to a year ago, uh, talk to us about it because there are some sort of uh, hurdles that sometimes have to be um, hurdled to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to maintain jurisdiction. So we do, uh, you know, please do uh, talk to us. And complaints uh, can be filed, as I say, uh, at the division or in state court not both, that's also a little complicated because if you file with us, usually you will be able to go to state or federal and certainly to federal court. Uh, but uh, that's again, something we wanna you know, talk to you about. Okay, as I mentioned, the human rights law requires uh, that, uh, that complaints uh, be investigated promptly and now they really are. And that's an initial finding uh, of probable cause that we're looking toward making. And the um, investigation can take any number of routes. They will not usually just be on papers unless it's a particularly simple case. So we will certainly interview witnesses, have a written or oral inquiry. We can go to the employment, uh, all, where the employment occurred in the appropriate case. We can have one or two party conferences, any other method deemed suitable by the regional directors. So. There's a very broad range of what we can do to investigate a case and get documents and other information from a, uh, from a respondent, including subpoenas. So then we make a determination and within that 180 days, and uh, it's either going to be, uh, we're gonna determine jurisdiction first, making sure we have jurisdiction, and then we're going to make a determination of probable cause or no probable cause. And uh, if it's a, a, a probable cause, which means it's the probable cause to believe that discrimination may have occurred, so it's not a very high standard uh, that, I mean, it's, it's relatively easy to meet, then we, um, then we send the case on to a public hearing. If we find no probable cause, the case is dismissed and the case can be appealed to court. So if there's probable cause, that means the case is going to have a public hearing before an administrative law judge. And that hearing is pretty much a, a trial. It is a trial. There's not a lot of discovery beforehand, but uh, testimony is taken under oath. Witnesses are subject to cross-examination. It's a full record. It usually lasts a day or two. And um, you can have your own attorney for that if you're a complainant, or a division attorney will be assigned to represent, to present the case in support of the complaint if you don't have your own attorney. Uh, doesn't represent the complainant directly, but their interests coincide for these purposes. So the playing field is leveled by virtue of how our law is written and, and how we assign attorneys to present cases. Administrative law judge makes a recommended order to the commissioner and she reviews it all. She is the only, the final and only arbiter. So she can um, decide whether to accept the recommendation or not and find discrimination or not. And these are the kinds of things the commissioner can award. We've talked about some of them, reinstatement to a job with back pay, any kind of provision of housing or access to public accommodation, all these kinds of things can uh, include reasonable accommodation uh, as part of, of what is required uh, to be done. Compensation for mental uh, anguish as as we awarded $850,000, that was cut down by a court, but there's no limit to that uh, in the appropriate circumstance. It can really be quite significant. Certainly in order to cease and desist any discriminatory practices, a requirement for training and other kinds of uh, injunctive relief to make sure that this doesn't continue with respect to other people. Uh, civil fines and penalties are available in all 
of our um, in all of our cases. And I let it go at that because until this legislative session, attorney's fees and punitive damages were only available in housing cases. That is also going to change. They will now be available in employment cases as well uh, within uh, the next uh, within the next uh, few months. I'm again not sure of the effective date, but that that's coming down the road. And just finally, either side can appeal to court. That's how we get all those court cases that I was discussing. Uh, the division appears um, on behalf of any finding of uh, discrimination, and uh, we, our own attorneys, appear and argue those cases, and we seek enforcement of the commissioner's order if the respondent is failing to comply. And some of the cases I mentioned uh, to you were enforcements by the division. So our resources, I'll let somebody else talk here. Go ahead. Everyone. Sure. So um, Commissioner Angela Fernandez here. Uh, so our resources for more information, uh, you can go to our uh, website and uh, find a discrimination based on sexual orientation, uh, the laws around discrimination based on gender identity or expression, and uh, gender identity discrimination by hospitals. Um, these are uh, either one-pagers or a trifold um, that both um, uh, provide um, uh, an explanation of the law and also uh, some key examples. Um, and with that, thank you very much, um, uh, General Counsel uh, Caroline, Caroline Downey, for that um, very thorough uh, explanation. And um, uh, we are now opening it up for uh, questions. Um, uh, before we go into the questions, I do want to remind everyone uh, that we do have uh, multiple ways that you can connect with the New York State Division of Human Rights. Uh, please follow us on uh, social media. You'll see our um, uh, handles and our tags uh, up on the uh, screen. And then also, if you sign up uh, with our, to our newsletter by simply emailing newsletter at dhr.ny.gov, um, uh, then you will be um, uh, signed up to receive our uh, regularly scheduled newsletters. So with that, um, I would like to start uh, with the first question um, that came in, um, uh, which I'm addressing to our general counsel. Uh, the question is, would bus stops or shelters uh, and presumably I'm thinking, you know, bus stops um, uh, and, and other public shelters be considered places of public accommodation? Well, the provision of, um, the provision of public transportation mm -hmm. is uh, considered places of public accommodation. There are some limitations on what the requirements are uh, for um, a disability uh, relative to that in our law. But sure, I mean, it, you know, how if, if getting on, if it, let's say it's a private bus company, just to make it simpler, uh, and they are not putting uh, either, they're not putting bus stops in places for a particular, you know, for a discriminatory reason or one that could be allegedly discriminatory, uh, if that's what the question is, or, uh, you know, then, then that would be something that we could look at because or, how you use the accommodation without having the bus stop. Or could it be, for example, if um, uh, a uh, person was um, uh, denied access onto a bus? Uh, oh, for sure, uh, Potentially yeah. due to their gender Absolutely, expression. right. Oh, yes, no, for sure. I so, mean, we, you know, there's historical cases, certainly. Uh, so with, if yeah. someone experienced that, they could come to uh, the New York State Division of Human yeah. Rights file a claim and uh, we could investigate yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Under early, you know, under other bases, there were many concerning uh, transportation issues uh, that, that we can address also in terms of the new uh, okay. characteristics as well. And before I go on to the next question, I do also want to um, uh, let everyone know uh, that um, uh, the um, entire webinar will be um, accessible on uh, YouTube. Uh, this is being uh, recorded, uh, also on Facebook, um, and uh, the PowerPoint will be um, uh, downloadable. Um, the next question uh, actually addresses that. Will the presentation be available later for download? Um, and yes, it will be. And as I mentioned, also a, a video of, on YouTube and on Facebook. How is it determined whether training should be conducted or is it mandatory for everyone? What is the criteria? Okay, uh, that, so um, right now, as of last year's legislative session, um, sexual harassment training is required uh, for all employers in New York. And um, we've done a lot of work with the Department of Labor. It's not under the human rights law, it's under the labor law. 
but we've done a lot of work with the Department of Labor to make a model policy, model procedure, model complaint form, and model training available so all employers have to with respect to sexual harassment. Uh, there may be some, I don't think this legislative session it's going to be uh, required uh, specifically for other areas, I don't know, uh, but right now under the law it's just sexual harassment. However, when an employer is um, sued here or, or uh, you know, at the EOC or in court, um, you know, one of the things we look at first is was there a policy and procedure in place so that people know, uh, so that all employees would know what is forbidden and prohibited and uh, that employees would also know what their rights are. So what people would know both what their rights and responsibilities are. And if we find that is not, uh, if, if the employer doesn't have any kind of policy like that, that looks very bad to us. <laughs> and because how can um, other employees know what is unlawful and how can employees know what to, to do uh, if they are discriminated against on any of these bases. So yes, that's, uh, with respect to sexual harassment, it's specifically required under the labor law um, throughout the state. And, and you can look on our website, all those policies and procedures are, are available there. It'll click you over to where they are and all the training and, and there are a lot of FAQs, it's very useful. Um, and then the, uh, everybody else should be doing it too, even if it's not particularly required. And um, uh, isn't it true that a commissioner's order could also uh, mandate a particular kind of training? Yes, and absolutely. And in fact, that was one of the areas that we, we gave, yes, that's a very important part because we're not just trying to um, stop, you know, when, when you bring a complaint to us, we know what your situation is, but it's unlikely that other people aren't experiencing similar things in the workplace. So we want to make sure that it, it doesn't just end with your complaint, even if you are able to, to get um, a remedy for it and that other people, that's part of our job to make sure that it stops in the workplace. And that's an example of how the commissioner's orders can um, uh, really make um, uh, an order um, uh, that is related to the public interest. Um, so the next question is, um, uh, is uh, not exactly on topic, but it is definitely related. Um, uh, have there been any cases of discrimination against HIV positive individuals pertaining to housing? If so, how was it resolved? I know that this is a very large and important area of the law for us, the Division um, uh, for Human Rights, um, uh, but Caroline, if you can just you know, briefly uh, comment on uh, the fact that we do have that jurisdiction. Right, we certainly do have that jurisdiction and um, it, it's covered under our disability jurisdiction and we interpret that as I say very broadly. I know there were cases, I mean especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, there were more cases than there are now relative uh, to people who were, who were HIV positive uh, and you know some uh, terrible um, discrimination that occurred. So certainly we do cover that. Uh, I can't think of any uh, court of uh, appellate division cases with that, but I know we have many uh, circumstances in which we've addressed that. And, and like any disability, the, employ the housing provider cannot discriminate based on disability of whatever your particular disability might be. Okay, very good. You know, one um, uh, thing I also uh, want to note is that um, as, a, as a division, we can also initiate what's called a division initiated investigation. So if we don't have a claimant or maybe the claimant doesn't want to proceed on their own uh, or even with us, um, but, we, but that there is some suspicion of a systemic pattern, then we can send in testers, we can send in uh, investigators, um, and, uh, and identify if there's a systemic pattern of discrimination. Um, and so that would also apply um, mm -hmm. uh, here with um, under the gender law. Um, are schools and religious entities exempt? For example, can a religious entity deny same-sex spousal benefits? Mm. Well, um, you're talking about employment, I presume. So it really, it, it really, <laughs> Depends. Uh, the Supreme Court a couple of years ago in a case called Hosanna Tabor broadened the, um, broadened the view of what a religious employee is or what a, a they, they call it the ministerial exception to, it was under Title VII and the federal anti-discrimination law, but it was, um, it was uh, not, it, it, pertains to us because it was determined on constitutional grounds. 
and found a very broad, uh, a broad yet not very well defined ministerial exception applied so that these laws don't even apply if someone were in the circumstance of uh, providing a, um, uh, a religious uh, tutelage in some way or another. So it, they're very case specific. But one of the first cases we had relative to um, to marriage uh, by people who uh, of the same sex, it happened to be an out-of-state marriage because it was back in 2006, but uh, it, it went to the issue of uh, whether someone could collect spousal benefits. And the, these people were, there was no question, it was, a, it was a big hospital, it was a big religious hospital, but these people were not in religious jobs at all. And we had no, the case ultimately settled, but we had no problem finding that they would not be considered employees who um, would come under the ministerial exception. There are exemptions in the human rights law for uh, religious institutions being able to um, hire people of the same religion, but this was not this was not a religious institution that did that. It was a big hospital, so you know it, that was not an issue at all. And um, so yes, we had same sex um, couples would be required to be treated equally as couples who were not of the same sex in terms of spousal benefits. But it it really does depend on the job. Uh, more than anything else uh, that is uh, involved in the Thank you. And there was a, there was another follow-up question um, uh, with that. Um, can a school require a transgender student to use a single-use bathroom? Uh, well, you know, as I said, we're just getting back into the public schools, but let's say it's a private school, which we do cover, no question, as of today. And I would say the same uh, pertains to what I said earlier. You know, if there's a single-use bathroom, that um, you know, we haven't had this case directly, but we feel comfortable enough to put it up in our examples um, that a single-use bathroom, anybody can use it, but nobody should be compelled to use it in lieu of using uh, the, the, um, the gender uh, bathroom that the person identifies with. So, uh, and that, it, that is an individual uh, circumstance, an individual choice. So, uh, that would pertain to schools as well. And when we get public school jurisdiction, we may um, you know, have this case come up. Thank you. If someone files discrimination with the New York State Division of Human Rights but lives in New York City, does the division have jurisdiction? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. There is a New York City Commission on Human Rights under New York City law, which is similar but not the same as ours. Um, and some say broader, although you know, talk to me next week. We're, we're getting pretty broad. Uh, but uh, they, and so you can file there. You can't do both, but you cer we certainly do. In fact, I think we looked, we have some over 2,500, what was it, Manny? 2,500 cases. Uh, of, of the 6,300 cases, it's over 2,000 we get from people in New York City. And um, how do you make a distinction, now in the employment area, how do you make a distinction between who has one employee versus who has an independent contractor? And are non-binary individuals protected as an independent contractor? So a couple things on that. Um, we um, so the issue I think is really you know whether the independent contractor is an employee, and we do the you know whether, we've always looked at um, if someone comes to us and says I've been discriminated against, and the employer says oh but they're an independent contractor we look at that very closely because um, it is you know it's it, Sometimes people are completely in the control of the employer and they're just calling them an independent contractor. Sometimes they've even signed a piece of paper saying I'm an independent contractor. That still doesn't make them an independent contractor under the law. So we look at the element of control that the employer has over the individual. And if, it, if, if it's considered an employer, employee relationship, uh, which, you know, um, is not uh, perhaps, you know, the plumber who goes to your house kind of thing, but uh, could be, you know, uh, a number of plumbers who work for an employer, uh, then, then we, um, we can maintain our jurisdiction. So they're quite um, individualized, the assessment, many of our, most of our cases are individualized assessments, but uh, we don't just take the employer's word for it, even if there's a, a, a signed agreement, because lots of times employers do that to get out of 
some of the obligations of being an employer. And then so, and are, and are non-binary individuals protected as independent contractors? Well, as independent contractors, if they come in under the employment um, piece, as I said, so we look at that. So, but the other, the other aspect of that is that uh, last year uh, the law was amended uh, to uh, make it clear that an employer is liable for what happens in the employer's workplace if the employer knew about it, even to non-employees. And that would include independent contractors, anybody who's working in the workplace uh, by virtue of an arrangement with the employer. And that was a last year's sexual harassment, but guess what, as part of the uh, legislation this year, it's being extended to all areas of discrimination, not, to, not even just harassment, but all areas of discrimination. So that would include non-binary as well. And, and in fact, that probably would have included under sex harassment to some degree as well, too. Thank you. Would youth in foster care, detention, group homes uh, be covered under housing? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Detention is is not something is usually we're not going to be able to um, look into, and and we we do cover, for example, um, as housing uh, homeless services and that kind of thing. So really, I mean, you, you named a number of different things in there. So uh, if if it's if it's um, detention related in nature. We're not going to be able to, to look at it because it's going to be under jurisdiction of corrections or some other program. Uh, but if it's uh, in homeless related, that kind of thing, then, and, and it's more in the nature of housing, then we can look at it. It really depends on the circumstance. Um, so it is 3.37. We know that we start a few minutes um, after three. Um, uh, we only have time uh, for maybe one or two more um, questions. So. Um, the next question is, uh, when, excuse me, what should an employer do if an employee is discriminated against by a client or a customer? Okay, that's a great uh, question, and it really falls right within, uh, well, two things. It falls within the, um, the new legislation, but actually, it, it, this is something we would always cover because the employer is always liable for any kind of harassment of its employees that it knows about. And that includes by clients, customers. Those are hard, perhaps, for an employer to deal with, but the employer has to deal with it because it's the employer's obligation to provide a harassment-free environment for uh, employees to work. And uh, so it can be it can be a big customer. I wouldn't could name some names that we've all seen in the news. It, it's the employer's obligation to make sure that that doesn't happen and whatever it takes is, is required. That's a very good question. And um, uh, another employment related question. How uh, would this apply to a transgender person who lives and works in New York, but is employed by a company based in another state? For example, a sales rep. Well, you're going to get bored of me saying it depends, but so there's case law. So if you actually uh, work in New York and your place of business is here, uh, you, we, we cover what happens in New York and people who live in New York. And usually it's people who live in New York and it happens in New York, but sometimes it's people who don't live in New York and it happens in New York. Sometimes it's people who live in New York and it doesn't happen in New York. So it really depends on where the discrimination is occurring. Uh, certainly, you know, it, it has nothing to do with whether transgender person or not, this just goes to general jurisdiction. So, uh, but if you're actually doing your work in New York and that is what is, is causing or your uh, things are happening to you, you know, the fact, because we, we certainly cover out-of-state employers who do business in New York and they may be doing business in New York uh, through an individual, even just a sale rep sales rep, and if their work is done in New York and that's where the discrimination occurs, then we would likely have jurisdiction, but we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you very much um, uh, to our general counsel. I also would like uh, to thank um, uh, the people that make this happen. Um, a production of this nature um, uh, does not happen by itself, so I want to thank uh, Manny Katarum uh, on our staff, um, Ruth Reynoso, um, who you may have been seeing some of the responses uh, directly, and um, also Rochelle uh, Dickerson. 
Um, for those uh, who uh, submitted questions that we were not able to answer here within this webinar, um, uh, you will be hearing from us directly. Um, and with that, I would just like to say thank you again uh, for joining us, and um, uh, please feel free um, to share any feedback. And uh, we will um, uh, be available to also conduct this webinar um, uh, in-house um, uh, in the future, and that is something that uh, we would like to engage with all of you about that. So thank you very much, and uh, please sign up, join us, become uh, part of, uh, of our family um, so that we can ensure that uh, especially the most marginalized communities know what laws um, are on the books and that we are here to enforce them. Thank you.